Our nation has suddenly become a sh- be sure your sins will find you out society, writes Cynthia Hild. As we read about the, expo- the exploits of prominent men who have selfless- selfishly abused women, we have to ask, is this not biblical? The scripture tells us, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A ram reaps what he sows. Whatever or whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap everlasting life. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Of course, that doesn't mean you'll gain everlasting life. It means that you'll be contributing to the rewards you'll get as a Christian in heaven if you're doing right. But if you're sowing to the flesh, you're just wasting time. And of course, to be saved in the first place, you must trust in Jesus. You must confess you're a sinner. As the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you must ask Jesus, the Son of the living God, whom you must choose to believe is who he says he is, equal with the Father. John 10.30, he died on the cross, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 15, we find out. And he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Certainly, these men are reaping the destruction of their reputations and careers. It is a high price to pay for indulging the flesh. It is better to understand the reality of this truth sooner than later. So, in light of this verse, perhaps the question to ask is, how should I live in order to please the Spirit? In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he wrote, And he, Jesus, died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who their, who for their sake died and was raised. Second Corinthians 5.15 Focusing on pleasing the Spirit and living for Christ frees men from trying to navigate the minefield of what constitutes proper behavior toward women. I think of Captive Joseph serving Potiphar in Egypt. Potiphar's wife continually tried to entice Joseph to have an affair. Yet Joseph's response was irresolute. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Genesis 39, 9. A dear friend's daughter spent this past Christmas without her four children because her husband, a former elder in the church, divorced her and quickly remarried. This year, he had the children for the holidays. Our friend is heartbroken. This is a graphic example of living for self and pleasing the flesh. How could that man do such a wicked thing? Throughout scripture, we are instructed to love, to be holy, and to consider the needs of others above our own. One verse speaks specifically to men. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Titus 2.2 2. As older men amplify or exemplify these qualities, they are role models for younger men who are told to live wisely also. One of the crucial qualities mentioned for men in this verse is self-control. Self-control naturally occurs when you no longer live for yourself, and it is the guard at the gate of fleshly indulgence that can lead to immorality. A sterling example of an older man exercising self-control is Boaz, the kinsman redeemer for the Moabite widow Ruth. According to the custom of the day, Ruth expressed her desire to be redeemed by lying at the feet of Boaz. This took place in the dead of night, yet Boaz lovingly guarded the reputation of Ruth. Choosing to live to please God is essential to having godly relationships, and the Bible gives us practical advice. Paul gave Timothy a very simple and straightforward guideline to men in relating to women. Treat older women as you would your mother, and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. 1 Timothy 5.2 This principle for relating to women is easily applicable. How do you treat your mother? How do you relate to your sister? You care for them. You respect them. You treat them with all purity. As you seek to apply this admonition, let me share some suggestions. At times, Paul writes that we are to greet one another with a holy kiss. While I do not experience this frequently, I define a holy kiss as a quick peck on the cheek given at a safe distance with no embrace. I also think that there is a holy hug, or at least a safer one, it is given sideways. I recall a conversation conversing with an older woman after a Sunday service. As we visited, we watched her husband as he greeted several women with hearty hugs. She wistfully observed, He never hugs me the way he hugs other women. Years ago, I made a decision that as much as I could control my circumstances, I would not be alone with a man, my husband excluded. My resolve was tested when one of our pastors asked me to lunch to discuss the women's ministry. I knew his motives were pure, but I also knew that we both needed to avoid all appearance of evil. I said, yes, lunch will be fine. May my husband join us? The decision to not put yourself in a vulnerable position is crucial. So I hope you will commit to no work lunches, no work travel, no counseling alone with another woman. If you must meet alone with a woman outside of dating, then meet in an office with the door open. I will always remember the downcast woman who told me this unfortunate story. As a Christian, she was delighted to work for a 
Christian man whom she knew from church. After a few months, there was a, h- a lull in the day, and he invited her to lunch. One lunch led to another, which led to an affair. The woman left her husband, but ultimately her boss was not willing to leave his wife. When we met, she was raising her three children alone, and she was heartbroken because her husband was too deeply hurt to reconcile. Both the man and woman in this story made very poor decisions, but perhaps if the man had treated her as his sister with all purity, and if his purpose in life had been to please the spirit by being self-controlled and worthy of respect, then it all could have been avoided. I leave you with this thought from author Jerry Bridges. God does not require a perfect, sinless life in order for us to have fellowship with him, but he does require that we be serious about holiness, that we grieve over sin in our lives instead of justifying it, and that we earnestly pursue holiness as a way of life. It's how they did it in the olden days, and it's how we should do it now.